1229, we'll call it good. I'm going to get started. So welcome to putting the audio in scouting. Um, this is designed for cut masters, den leaders, pretty much anybody who's creating ideas, looking at annual planning. What are we going to do to spice up our calendar, make things interesting and exciting? I'm going to sit here because I feel comfortable. Um, I'm going to introduce myself real quick because I went around and asked you guys real quick. My name is Mike Holtz. Uh, I am a Native Oregonian, I was born, raised, and educated down in Corvallis. Yes, I do read black and orange. If you are a duck fan, I'm not. Please excuse the interruption. Will all of the LDC participants please report back to their classroom? Thanks. Um, well, the LDC did go poof. Yeah, when they went to lunch. A whole bunch of gaggle of Boy Scouts, and, you know, maybe there were cheerleaders off of it. Who knows? Uh, I was a scout, a Cub Scout for three years, a Boy Scout for seven years. I earned a bunch of stuff. It's a big part of who I was as a youth and who I am today as an adult. Um, I drifted away from scouting when I went to college, not because I went away to college, but because engineering school was hard. Uh, so I didn't have time to go camping and have those fun things. I moved up here to Portland to start my career, got married, bought a house, eventually had a couple of kids, two boys. Uh, you can probably see where this story is going, right? My oldest son, three years ago, just a little bit more, brought home a flyer that says, join Cub Scouts, it's fun. And I said, oh, okay, I'm scouting. So I got out my bucket of you know, <coughs> uniforms and books and sashes and things and had this discussion of what scouting is all about. And by the end of that discussion, I had to make sure that it was my son that wanted to join Cub Scouts, <laughs> and not me. Uh, today, I have a Weebelows and a Wolf, and they're having a blast. And shortly after finding our pack, there's a long story for how we found our pack. Don't worry about that. We found a pack, and my predecessor, who was in our district executive, oddly enough, pointed to me and said, uh, you're next to be committee chair. So uh, that's how I've been tapped for that. I've been doing that for nearly three years. And then, fair warning, two years ago at, Brown, at the University of Scouting, I was asked to be a Cub Scout Roundtable Commissioner. And for some reason, I didn't end up saying no. I've been doing that for sounds about, sounds about two right. years. And for some reason, about seven months ago, Karen approached me and asked me to be vice chair of general courses here at the university. The story here is I need to learn how to say no. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> the point, I, the reason I put this last one on here is because I learned something over the past six months. Each of you has forms in your packets uh, to fill out and to give back feedback. One, at Woodbadge, we learned feedback is a gift. Go to Woodbadge if you haven't done yet, it's awesome. But feedback is a gift. And let me tell you something, when I was a participant here for so many years, I would look at that form and say, nobody's going to read what I write. Nobody cares what I'm writing in this class. I was dead wrong. Every single thing that anybody writes when the rating is made is recorded and poured over by at least half a dozen people. Every class has an aggregate rating that goes in to make an average of how do people like this. And every single comment is recorded and stored for next year. We have changed instructors. We have changed courses based on feedback. So please do. Fill out that form, especially if you really don't like a class or if you really like it. If you're in the middle, just say, yeah, class is fine. That's okay. Um, but I want you to know that we do care. We do read those things. So let's get back to the syllabus. Today, uh, this is putting the audience in scouting. We're going to talk about ideas you can take back to your pack and your den. Take these scouts out. Have a good time. How to create an exciting 12-month calendar. It's kind of buried in here. So we're going to talk about some resources. Things you can find out there, places you can go, things you can do, um, and all that kind of stuff. So, things to keep in mind as you do this. This is great for like annual planning. Make sure whatever you're planning is age and ability appropriate. We're not going to take a gaggle of tiger cubs and go scale now, but it's not going to happen. Make sure it's accessible. Make sure if you have a scout who is wheelchair bound, that's their mobility issue, that you don't choose trails that the scout can't go with you on. Find trails that are accessible. Uh, we, in our pack, and a lot of packs, have families in all portions of the socioeconomic spectrum. Make sure your activities are affordable and accessible for the most part. It's okay to occasionally do an expensive overnighter, but hikes are free, disc golf is free, you know, going fishing is very cost effective. There are lots of things you can do that don't cost money. And if you start doing all the ex expensive stuff, every month it's bowling or ice skating or whatever, that's $10 cover charge, you're going to start excluding people. We don't want to exclude people. We want to invite as many people as we possibly can to every activity. Be prepared. Well, it feels like there's a motto in there somewhere. I'm going to go, I forget. Uh, for all possible things, weather conditions. What happens if we go on a hike and a lightning strike hits? Where do we go? What do we do? Uh, for potential problems, what if the car breaks down? What if 
the bowling alley we go to is closed for some reason. Do you have a contingency plan? It, these things tend to happen sometimes. And make sure you have the help that you need. If you're going to take 40 Cub Scouts on a hike for five miles, you're going to need more than two adult leaders. Common sense, just keep it in mind. Remember to give your families plenty of notice. Telling your families, oh, uh, this Saturday is Thursday, let's say. This Saturday we're going to uh, Silver Falls for a hike. Come with us. Not enough lead time. You need to get that calendar out there early. You need to let your families know weeks, months in advance. By the way, these are all on the disc, all the slides. Oh. <laughs> I need to take furious notes. I'm sorry, I didn't miss that. Um, give your fun families plenty of notice. Yes, go ahead. Can you make that statement next time at the beginning? So that I'm not. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, got I just, I just I'm realized right, right, right. you figured out who have really been at this class before. Yeah, no, I'm mean. sorry. I'm yeah, going on the eval. These are, these are. Oh, yeah. oh, you <laughs> made me cry. He didn't tell me it was available <laughs> on the desk. I scribed everything down. Uh, give your flint families plenty of notice. Let them know if, if you need it. There's a whole thing. West Forty does scouting safely. All about stuff like uh, tour activity plans. Know when you need to submit one, and it never hurts to submit a tour and activity plan, even if you don't know if you need it. There's a whole set of rules where you absolutely do. It never hurts. Send it to council, say, hey, we're going on overnight, or we're going here. Uh, make sure you have all the necessary documents ready. If you're going to go camping, go on an overnight, or make sure you have those medical forms for every participant. So if something, heaven forbid, happens, you can get that person the help they need, and all the information is there. Okay, here's my analogy. The Cub Scout program is a layered cake. Our den leaders, week after week, provide the advancement program. That is the cake itself. That's what we're here for. That's what holds everything together. That is the foundation of our program. The stuff we're talking about here is the frosting. <clears throat> it's the fun stuff you put on top that keeps the Cub Scouts coming back for more. And we have all seen that elementary school age boy that licks the frosting off the cake and leaves the cake behind, right? And there's, an, there's, there's a point to be made here that if we don't do these fun things, sometimes for the sake of just having fun, then your scouts might become less engaged and less likely to come back, especially if your den meetings aren't as exciting and your pack meetings are, are, are withering a bit. Yes, there's a lot of things to be said about making your den meetings exciting and your pack meetings fun. We're talking about getting those scouts outside of the pack meeting going and doing something fun. This can help to engage those scouts and make them want to come back. Sometimes it's just fun for the sake of having fun. There are a lot of examples of uh, I'm a big award aficionado. I love to guide my scouts into earning awards. As a committee chair, I like to guide my adults into earning things like den leaders training, scouters training. My analogy is awards are the cream filling. It's that thing you slice into, you take a bite, and go, whoa, I didn't expect that. That's good. That's what awards are. And your scouts will enjoy earning something extra and wearing a recognition point for what they did. I love awards. Um, our former district director had a phrase, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. It's a little harsh, but there's a point to be made here of, you should evaluate. Is this going well? Are we having fun? Is there something we need to adjust and do differently next time? I see trees. That's what I mean. No? Just lunch? Okay. Welcome. Yeah, put, in, put in the outing and scouting? Yes. All right, cool. We'll put in the outing and scouting. I break these three things down, types of activities, into three different brackets. Day trips. Get up in the morning, you go do something with Cub Scout, come home and go back to bed at night. Boom, done. 80% of my slides are part one. Number two, indoor overnighters. We go somewhere, they have a program, we sleep overnight, we come home. And then camp, camping, going camping, stuff like that. Uh, there was a great question about a year and a half ago in my rental presentation of, well, if our scouts go to the Oregon Zoo and do their zoo snooze, which we'll talk about, is that camping? Went all the way to national, came all the way back, the answer is no. Camping is done outside. Inside is a sleepover. Keep that in mind. When you're looking at bears going camping with your pack, period, or wolves go camping with your pack or, or family, camping is done outside. This kind of stuff is inside, not camping. So we'll talk about both of those. So let's get started. This is my list that came out of an annual planning meeting some years ago. Um, again, this will be in your, your, your disc, you don't have to write all these down. It's just a whole slew of ideas. The middle things are mostly sports. There is absolutely nothing wrong with taking a frisbee or a soccer ball or whatever out to a field and having your scouts play ball, play frisbee, ultimate, whatever, ice skating, rollerblading, scooter, what have you. 
Uh, all kinds of good stuff here on the right that are cost effective. Disc golf, geocaching is nearly free. Model rockets, you're talking about five or ten bucks. We do that once a year. Uh, fishing is nearly free. Going on a hike and bicycling is free. You can do things like mini golf and bowling and uh, you know doing stuff like that. You're talking about yeah, five ten dollar cover charge stuff like that. There are all kinds of other things you can do over here. Going to see something interesting, whether it be a museum, a food producer up here in Vancouver, Frito Lay might be willing to give you a tour, Reesers and Beaverton, that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm giving you know lip service to our classics, Pinewood Derby, Ring of Regatta, that sort of stuff. Um, I count those as pack events outside of pack day. So things to keep in mind. Some examples for you guys. Uh, I love this photo. And I don't know where this comes from, but I like it because my presumption here is both of these boys are from two different dens of decent size, and they don't interact much outside of the pack meeting. We may have a new friend here. Going on a hike, the entire pack, not just the den, you get to have further interactions with boys that aren't just your age, right? Tigers meeting wolves, etc. I think this is fantastic. This is why I like to have uh, what I've done here, actually, well, I like to have pack activities that enable our den leaders to take advantage of those things for advancement. As a point of that, I've made two of these. Two things are buried in here, uh, basically lesson plans. The first one is a hike. We're going to go on a hike and we're going to try to cover as many advancement things as we possibly can. Later on, we're going to talk about going camping. Anybody LDS? Okay. Uh, LDS wants to go camping. So for all of us, it applies to everybody. So we're going to start with, with hiking. I have decided because I like it, we're going to go to Tryon Creek. It happens to be about 35 minutes from where you're sitting right now. Anybody familiar with Tryon? Know where it is? It's, it's in Portland. I'll show you the map. Lots of different trail distance options uh, for hiking. There's a staff nature center that's important. I'll show you why in a minute. It's forested, but it's safe. It's, it's undercover. You know, if it rains, you're going to get wet, but you're not going to get a lot of sunburn. It's really roasty outside. So Tryon Creek is up here. Right by Portland, we are sitting here in Newburgh. Uh, for those of us in the Portland area, Beaverton, Hillsboro, you know, if you're from Kalapulia, I'm sorry, but there are places like this everywhere. Campoobie has an interpretive center. THPRD in Beaverton by Nike has a staff nature center. They're everywhere. Really, what you want to find is some place that has lots of different options, scatter of trails, and some kind of staff nature center. That's the point. And some place that's relatively close to you. So we're going to go to, go to try it. And we're going to try to meet at the nature center and allow the scouts 10 to 15 minutes to explore and see what's in there and, and find new things and learn something. It's kind of our gathering activity. We're going to get all our scouts outside when everybody's arrived and we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about the outdoor code, the leave no trace. We're going to show and discuss the six essentials. Some of our scouts have to gather those and bring them themselves. Our tigers probably don't have to. They can just like see them and go, oh, yeah, OK, first aid kit, good. And we're going to talk about the buddy system, why it's important. Find a buddy, stick with your buddy. Our tigers are going to go on a short hike. They're going to do some plant identification, animal identification. We'll see what that's all about. The wolves, all they have to do is go on a one mile hike. Bears go on a one mile hike and observe nature and identify animals. And yes, you probably already figured out that if you have small dens, they can all go together. Tigers can do a one mile hike, especially if it's not too steep or rough or whatever. If you have bigger dens of 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, then you should probably have your dead leaders lead the hike and they can go different directions and different things. That's totally up to you. That whole thing for these three dens should take all of about mm, 45 minutes. And then when they're done, if they want, you know, assuming your tiger sibling doesn't have a weebelows or whatever, they can go home and do their thing. Your weebelows den leader needs a little more preparation. Because the weebelows are going to go a three mile hike, they're going to talk about the leadership roles. In a hiking situation, they're going to actually eat lunch on their hike and dispose of their lunch waste properly, and they're going to do a service project. Now, a service project can be something as simple as every scout has a plastic bag and will pick up litter if you find them on the trail. That's okay. It doesn't have to be an Eagle Scout project, right? It could be something more involved, whatever you want it to be, but it should be up to the will be below as den leader. If you want to do a quick reparations or some kind of a thing, or, or um, reparations wasn't the right word, but, you know, um, uh, invasive species removal sort of thing for an hour afterwards. Cool, that's great. But your Weeblos den leader needs a little more prep for that. So, here's a map. This is the northern part of uh, Tryon Creek. There's a nature center here in the parking lot. And this is our 1.1 mile loop. You start at the nature center, you go around, it's fun, and you come back, you end up at the nature center. Hey, isn't that great? We're right where we started. It's a really easy one. I've done this with a four-year-old, guys. It's not hard. 
a little bit of, little bit of elevation change, not much. I'm going to zoom out a little bit and tell you about what our weeblows are going to do. I found this loop on a hike four miles in Portland site or something. So this is a 3.9 mile loop. You can probably make it a three mile loop by doing a cutoff right about here. I didn't do the math, but I'm guessing that's about what it comes down to. So your weeblows have obviously a longer hike and they're going to find some place to do a service project. They'll stop, you know, over here and have lunch or whatever. Avoid the horses and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to take them I don't know what, an hour and a half, two hours, depending on how involved the service project is, to do three miles. What do we accomplish? Your tiger den leader will thank you because you have knocked off six of the seven requirements for tigers in the wild. Notice six essentials, outdoor cove, ego trace, that short hike. There's your plant animal identification, two different trees. Your tiger den leader should be aware of this and be able to integrate that into the hike. And there's your nature center. Look at that. Your wolf den leader will thank you because you've hit five of the eight requirements for pause in the path, six essentials, buddy system, uh, outdoor cove, leave no trace, watch and record two interesting things while we go hiking. That's easy to do, bring your book. Your bear den leader will thank you because you've covered over half the requirements for fur, feather, and ferns. Animals, insects, bikes, things like that. There's your nature center again. Wildlife from a distance, describe what you saw. Oh, your bear den leader's gonna bring a magnifying glass. Our bear den leader kept forgetting to do that. It happens. Your Weeblows leader will thank you because you nearly accomplished well five of the eight requirements for Weeblows walkabout. Again, outdoor code, leave no trace, uh, hike three miles, nutritious lunch, enjoy it, clean up, and do the service project. Uh, and then this is the leadership roles, which really should be covered in the den meeting prior, realistically. So that's the hike example. Again, you can apply this to lots of different areas in Oregon. We have lots of places to go hiking. Um, questions, thoughts, comments? I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> cool. Back to the curriculum. We like to go bike riding. This is my pack almost three years ago going on a bike ride. We're here in Beaverton, Beaverton area. Um, and this is a parking lot off of Denny Road 217, THPRD, the, the nature center, the, the parks district owns. And there's a greenway path that goes all the way down to Metzger Park and Tiger. We met here at 10 a.m., did a little bike safety check. Everybody's got a helmet, helmet fits. Bike down to Metzger Park. Yeah, it takes about an hour, maybe. Depends on how many flat tires you have. We only have one flat tire. We had some time in the park for the Cubs guys to play. Enjoy, I brought popsicles, we brought popsicles. And then we biked back, we were done by noon. Home for lunch. It's a great example of a day outing. Simple, and unless you have to go buy a bike, it's basically free. You could do a bicycle rodeo. I did this when I was a Cub Scout, it was great. Oftentimes, your local sheriff's department, your local police department will be happy to come and facilitate a bicycle rodeo. They'll set up maybe an obstacle course, they'll do safety checks, stuff like that. Hey, look, bicycle rodeo with your tigers. Learn how to do hand signals, do a safety check. A lot of these things can be checked off by the sheriffs, by this police department, whoever it is that's there. Uh, all kinds of neat stuff. We like to take our Cub Scouts up to the snow of Aubrey Lodge every uh, winter and slide down the hill. It's often the highlight of the year for some of our Scouts. There's no advancement here. It's just fun for the sake of having fun. Um, and this is an example. We hire a bus to take us because we don't want to drive. We're lazy that way. We hire a big school bus and we truck about 45, 50 people up. And the cost of the bus and then we do food is about $25 per human that comes. So now you're talking about, okay, you're going to start excluding some people that don't want to spend 25 bucks to go to the snow for a day. But it's fun. And it's Aubrey Lodge, so it's council property. Disc golf. Find a disc golf course at a park and bring a frisbee. Free. An hour's activity, you're outside, you're getting a little exercise, you're having some fun. Uh, we tried to do this over the summer in August, and it was 110 degrees outside. Two families showed up, but we had fun. It was good. Disc golf is great. I love it. Uh, consider getting your Cub Scouts outside at night to look at the stars, do some astronomy, see what's out there, see if you can find Jupiter and some moons and things like that, and connect maybe with an astronomy club. We have astronomy clubs here in Portland. I think there's one in Salem. Uh, see if you can find an amateur astronomer to come out and guide your Cub Scouts and show them where the constellations are and where the planets are and what's going on. Hey, look, there's an astronomy one. Tiger, sky is the limit. Uh, find some constellations, make your own constellation, there's the planetarium, observatory, all kinds of neat things. And this can be facilitated by a pack outing out to the astronomy evening, per, per chance. 
How about going to a baseball game, or a basketball game, or a football game? Uh, my pack, we used to do the Blazer Overnighter when they did Blazer Overnighter in the back before they stopped doing it. And it was an interesting event. Uh, since then, we did the Hillsboro Hops thing. I know the Volcanoes do a um, night down in, in Salem. Somebody said something about Portland pickles. I have no idea what that is. Ben, would bad buddy. Um, but there are all kinds of semi-pro, pro, amateur, even even high school football to take your scouts to. Uh, we're going to go see my hack. We're going to go see the, the Thorns play soccer. We haven't done soccer yet. We did uh, the Winterhawks not uh, six, seven, eight months ago in the uh, season. That was fun. Not quite a fist fight on ice, but close. <laughs> But hey, look, sporting events come into different uh, um, adventures. And this one has, there's a lot of lot in here, but there are certain ones of go to a sporting event and talk to a person who participates and, you know, all this kind of good stuff. This can be facilitated, get, get a springboard. And again, later we'll see this as a springboard if you go to a sporting event. Fishing. Fishing is one of the first things I did as a Cub Scout 30 some years ago. Um, again, if you have the equipment, fishing is basically free. If you do take your coast guards out, make sure you know the laws, the requirements, the regulations. Uh, my father has never caught a legal fish in his life. So, you know, so make sure the game board doesn't come yank you over. But fishing is easy. And if you go to Butte Creek for an overnighter, uh, for camping, Butte Creek has a stocked pond. It's going to bring the gear and it's a catch and release. Hey, look, a bear goes fishing. There are only four requirements. Learn about fish. Learn about the regulations, learn about the equipment, and try to fish for a while. That's it. That's all there is to it. And your kids can get another belt loop, at least your bears. Uh, swimming. Now, I want to take a moment to preface this, that taking your Cub Scouts to a pool with a lifeguard is an entirely different endeavor than going and taking your Cub Scouts to the Sandy River and throwing them into the Sandy River. Uh, you can do that. You just have to have all the right people with all the right training to establish all the right kind of swimming areas and do the swimming tests and all those things. And I'd rather take them to a pool. Look at this. You take the Cub Scouts to a swimming pool with a lifeguard, and there are all kinds of different swimming activities. Uh, wolf, bear, and weeblos is a big one. You could probably knock that out in the better part of the day at the pool. In fact, uh, at Roundtable, we had a discussion with uh, one of our wolf leaders from the LDS side. And they basically go spend half a day at the pool and just knock out the spirit of water. And her big question was, this is great, I love this one. I have a Cub Scout that can't swim very well. And it says swim 25 feet or more. How do I get them to swim 25 feet or more? I said, and it doesn't say swim 25 feet or more without taking a break. Swim for a while and stop. Swim for a while and stop. It's OK. Don't put requirements where they don't exist. Read them literally. Swim 25 feet means you start here, you go there. If you get there eventually, you're good. My interpretation. Uh, take your scouts to the fire station. Cub scouts love the fire station. It's so much fun. We've done this almost every year. Take your kids or have them visit you, the police station, the sheriff's department, what have you. Uh, we had a canine unit from Clackamas County sheriffs come visit our den. I don't have a picture of it right here, but it was awesome. It was so much fun. And this kid loved it. Hey, look, there are public safety adventures you can tie in. Your tigers, the tiger and wolf, really have more to do with uh, first responder, um, whether it be EMT or uh, fire department. Just right outside. Stop, drop, and roll, blankets put on a fire, 911 safety quiz, stuff like that. Your, especially if you send these things to the EMTs, the firefighters, before you go and say, hey, can you cover some of these things? Great springboard. You could probably finish the rest of this off and have it in. Wolves have about the same thing, hometown hero, go visit with a hero. This could be either um, you know, law enforcement or firefighter kind of thing or EMT. A great springboard is pack activity. <clears throat> it's easier to take your den off into a, um, a fire station unless your pack is like 12, 15 scouts or something like that. The bear one is more investigative, law enforcement, sheriffs, fingerprints, chromatography, all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to take your pack or your den to a um, sheriff's park or something like that, that's a great one to look at. That's, that's too bad. Okay, I'm going to switch, switch a little bit here and mention that another great day activity is community service project. Um, I encourage all of our units in my district to do service projects, not just scouting for food, but other things throughout the year. 
And with community service, we're giving back to other humans as a service organization. Uh, I always like to encourage my group and our groups in our district, and I encourage you as well to give back to your charter organization, whether you're chartered by a church, a school organization, the Elks Club, the Sonic Lodge, the VFW, I don't care. Go to them and say, how can we help? How can we help you? Because you are housing us, you are, we exist because of you. Um, so that's a great way, place to start, sir. We do our churches uh, adopt them. That's fantastic. There you go. Because they're a bunch of, the congregation's elderly. So okay, they can't go out and pick up the can't children. Do it themselves, so. There you go. That's a good example. Thank you. Uh, adopt a school is a great program, especially if you're chartered by a PTO, PTA, PTC, something like that. I'll that soon. Uh, clothing ground. We used to do years back, Goodwill, Good Turn. They stopped the program. That doesn't mean that we, as a unit, can't decide, oh, we'll go collect and maybe give what we receive in terms of clothing in a similar manner that we use getting for food. We could take those to homeless shelters or something like that. Uh, same thing with book, uh, book drive, food drive, uh, the toy drive actually. Book and toy drive are very similar, you're just collecting different things and sending them to different locations. If you decide to do these things, make sure you get the word out to your neighborhood, your target audience, and let them know where you're taking these things and who's benefiting from this. We're just not collecting a whole ton of toys for Cub Scouts when you go home and have a lot of fun. Uh, food drive. Scouting for food is great. You can also, if you want, at some other point in the year, do your own food drive. Go to your community and say, hey, we're going to do this food drive and benefit our local pantry. Yeah, it's July, but people still are hungry in July. So help us out. Same thing. Get the word out. You're, you, you have the foot power in your Cub Scouts to go collect the materials and bring them back and, and sort them and do them with the food, uh, food drive. Another great one I was told of is um, the Oregon Food Bank has sorting locations. There's a coal pack store in Beaverton and two dry packs in Portland that are great ways for us to get back as well. It's apparently a lot of fun. Two scoops of raisins in this and one scoop of that. Scott's about that kind of stuff. And that didn't make the list here, I'm sorry about that. Uh, elderly, there's lots of great opportunities at nursing homes or uh, assisted living facilities, things like that. Reach out to the facility and ask how can we help, what can we do? Uh, Veterans Day, um, Memorial Park, I believe it is, always does, one of the big cemeteries over there always does the flags on Memorial Day, that's a good one to get tied into. And literally up and beautification, that's an easy one. You're somewhere, whether it be your charter board or some other place, and you're like, ah, let's just clean up the litter in this park on the That's the first example I have for you, actually. This is a service project my hack did about a year and a half ago. It was May 2015. And the story here is that we're, my back is started by a PTO, a school across the street and down a little bit. And for about two years, for a variety of reasons, we couldn't meet at the school. So we met next door at the church. The church was very welcoming, opened their doors to us, allowed us to meet. And the church owned this parking lot here across the street, and they didn't really do anything with it because they didn't use it and they were trying to sell it. And we had noticed, actually, Charter Orber, I've noticed, that walking past, uh, that there's just litter everywhere. Just papers and stuff. And <coughs> so we went to the church and said, hey, you know, thank you for housing us. Can we help? Can we, you know, pick up the litter in this parking lot? Said, sure, great, that would look nice. And so we, I asked our scouts to come out and lend us a hand, plastic bags, trash bags, all that kind of stuff. Picked up all the litter. Took us 45 minutes. That's it. We had, which you don't see here off the screen, <coughs> she had just run off screen, <coughs> four-year-old younger sister helped out. <coughs> Very accessible, siblings can help, as long as there aren't hypodermic needles or something dangerous and sharp. <coughs> you know, we were careful with a broken beer bottle. You can have everybody come help. Siblings, older, younger, whatever. Pro tip, this happened to be the same day as the Cub Scout shootout, if you're not familiar, you should come do that. We did this in the morning, we took all the Cub Scouts to the shootout in the afternoon and they had a blast. So positive reinforcement after helping us do the service project. Uh, you mentioned the flag placements at uh, some of the cemeteries here in Portland. It's a great way to get exposure, great photo opportunities as well. If you're trying to sell your pack, visual storytelling is a big deal these days. Get those pictures out there. Food drive. I'm not sure where this is from, that was a great food drive picture. Um, so you can do that yourself, you don't need somebody else's help or scouting for food to do it for you, organize it. Um, I need more photos, sorry guys. This is the Reader's Digest distilled version of a one hour presentation that I make, usually once a year. Lots of ideas. Do you guys have any other community service projects you guys do? You want to share? Go ahead. We do the food bank where they do the Christmas boxes. <coughs> oh, cool. And so all you're really doing is, is you, you go in, 
they'll say, hey, I'm, I'm looking for a couple of scouts to help this family, right. anywhere from two people in the family to ten. Right. And so you're, they have a whole assembly line, and so you're moving, they're just moving the boxes, and then helping them to load it into their car. Oh, interesting. So it's, it's, so where it's, is that? Um, it's Yam Hill in okay. 72nd. It's the so is it the order of it, yeah, it's okay. at the Ascension Lutheran, cool. but it's it's like three four hours. Okay. There, the church is emphatic to have us. They have plenty of donuts and <laughs> there are all sorts of positive sugar. Get those scouts, scouts, the scouts the energy they need. <laughs> but um, I bet the scouts enjoy it. Yes, yeah. the scouts enjoy it because they get to see. They don't. The adults will sometimes do driving when we will do delivery oh, to people's houses, okay. and so it's. You have a whole different conversation with the kids of, you know, every single one of you guys know that for Christmas you will be having something under the tree. Right. You will be having a hot. That's not true of everybody. And that's not true of everybody. And I do not want to hear, period, a comment. Yes. That's a good lesson, too. Yeah, it's a good lesson when you walk into a house that it's a single wide and there's 10 people living there and yeah. there's babies running around in diaper. Yeah, and, yep. and the kids are kind of like, whoa. I, you know, they, you know, where they're thinking that, woe is me because I don't have a brand new, My new Xbox, Xbox One. Yeah. That they have. And it's like, wow, I do have a lot. A lot. Yeah. And so it's, it's... That's an excellent point. It's... Yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> we also have anything else to share in terms of different community service projects you've done? All right. Um, definitely encourage you guys to do some. And if, when you do, make sure it's true with conservation. I'll talk about conservation service projects in just a second. Make sure you log your hours in the universe, the uh, National has a tool, the uh, service project reporting tool. National wants to know when we do service projects so they can aggregate that data and sell scouting at a higher level. And that rolls into your journey to excellence. Tell me you know journey to excellence, please. Journey to excellence is a scorecard that we do on an annual basis right about now when we're doing recharter. Uh, there are 11 different goals, everything from having a budget, having trained leadership, all the way down to doing service projects. Uh, Journey to Excellence, you'll find it on scouting.org. There are different scorecards for PAC, troop, team, crew, district, council, all kind of rolls up. Um, most of us, there are three different levels. There's bronze, our district earned bronze last year. Um, bronze, silver, gold, and most PACs can earn bronze in their sleep. They're real, it's really not that challenging. Fill out the form, hand it in with your recharter, and then wear a patch that your scouts can be proud of. Because this is the we're awesome patch. Okay, I'm going to move on to conservation service again. This is a great day activity where you get up in the morning, go out, do something good. And of course, the, the easy dividing line is with community service, we're giving back to other humans and helping them out. With conservation service, we're providing help for our planet locally, usually. Things like planting native trees, shrubs, grasses, doing wetland restoration, uh, invasive species removal. I talked about Tryon Creek just a few minutes ago. They've had a huge issue over the past 30 years or so with English ivy. And they have not wanted to use chemicals on it. And instead of getting out crossbow, they decided they're going to do pull it off by hand. And they, week after week, every Saturday, there are people out there pulling out by hand English ivy on the hillsides and the trails. And you can still see it today. And you'll be a part of that if you want. Your scouts out there, if you wish. Um, I'm not sure who exactly coordinates that, but there is a group of friends of trying to create. Those sorts of things exist in different places with different um, levels of accessibility for our customers. That's something you can do. Animal habitat restoration, I got a picture of that in just a second. Native bird support, bird house, bird feeder, bird bath, whatever, house construction. Uh, adopt the parks program, I'm not as familiar with it. I think it's similar to adopt a school. I hear good things. Uh, beach and waterfront cleanup is something that's been happening here in Oregon for a long time, and those are good things. Like uh, last time in my session I taught this, somebody talked about doing waterfront cleanup, and uh, it was a good experience. Uh, SOLV does a lot of that. Uh, I love SOLV. They're a great organization. Uh, SOLV Oregon I think. My pack has done two different projects with SOLV. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then recycling drive. Uh, one of the examples of recycling drive is if you live in a community with a lot of elderly folks, they might have things like paint cans with some paint left in it, turpentine, and other chemicals. And if you want, you can take your unit and collect those things in your neighborhood and properly get them disposed of. So that grandpa doesn't have that turpentine can in there and decide to just pour it down the, the uh, storm drain or whatever, right? 
or the can of paint that you might pour down just the drain drain. That's something you could potentially do, and that helps to keep things out of where they can be, out of where they can shouldn't be. Uh, I love this picture. I assume that they're doing uh, invasive species removal. Um, scouts and tools are hilarious. Planting trees is always a good one. Make sure you have somebody who's an expert, somebody to guide you. Yes, we can plant this type of tree here. Yeah, Friends of trees. Yes. We've been twice with them. Cool. Really good work. Okay. Uh, is that related to Guy Miller, or is no. I, the photo Guy, Guy Miller is like a, a clearinghouse? They'll point you to I've seen oh, kinds I, of trees. I think they're on there. Yeah, I've seen Solve, and then like Sherwood City something, and Tiger Wallet, and uh, but I've seen that. So you have some experience with that. So I, I have good experience with Solve. They're a great organization. It's Friends of Trees, um, and these scouts are doing their replanting with uh, their planting spades, having a good time. Uh, this is habitat restoration. Does anybody know what this is? Out of curiosity. Okay. So what's happened here is uh, you've had a forested area that has been cleared, whether it's clear cut or fire or whatever it doesn't really matter. You can't really tell. And you had a cleared area to a point where the natural balance of predator versus prey has been upset. Your raptors don't have any place to perch and hunt for mice, bulls, rats, gophers, moles, etc. So what these folks are doing is putting up raptor poles. And I'm sure they've had somebody tell them, yes, we have a problem here. We've had a population explosion of rodents or what have you, and we need to bring back the raptors in. And so they're putting up raptor posts, again, I'm assuming with guidance. So that's something you can involve in, potentially. Again, uh, you know, THPRD might have some notions of that. Uh, Jackson Bottom Wetlands down at Hillsboro does things like this. Connect with an organization locally to you that understands and knows and has. Um, you know, purview and, and rights to whatever you know, area it is that you'd like to work in and, and do something interesting. There are all kinds of different projects in the back of it. Uh, and I love, you know, Cub Scouts are going to get muddy, planting things, digging things around, and a muddy Cub Scout's a happy Cub Scout. Okay, those are my day trip activity ideas. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Questions, comments, thoughts before I move on? Got about 25 minutes. Doing good this time. Okay. So let's transition. Move my stool four inches um, to indoor overnighters. There are five organizations that I know of locally that do an overnighter program, and I can speak personally to three of them. I'd be curious to see if anybody of you out there know of others or know more about these than I do. I will start with the zoo, and the zoo does a program called the Zoo Snooze, and what you do is. You show up at about 5 p.m. in the parking lot, they take your gear, throw it in the van, and you get to <coughs> um, start exploring the zoo a little bit. And they have a very structured set of things they take you to, a lot of behind the scenes things. This is the uh, vet building that they're showing our scouts. Uh, you see the vet building, you see, oh, what else? I forget. There's a lot of different things that you see. And they kind of rotate you through. We took about I think it was 40 or 45 people, and so they split us up into three different groups. We had something like eight or nine scouts per, I think it was more groups than that, you know, a manageable size group of scouts, and they rotated us around. Professionals, by the way, are in blue, the volunteers are in red. So this was the, uh, the vet building, we got sort of a backstage tour. Uh, here we got a volunteer showing our Cub Scouts a tortoise and telling about why tortoises are interesting, and this tortoise actually had been rescued, uh, somebody put a leash on it by punching a hole right here in the shell and putting like a carabiner in it and it had been returned and brought to the zoo and rehabilitated. Of course it can't be released, uh, but you know, interesting stories like that. Uh, they also had a snake of some kind and a bearded dragon that was really interesting. The scouts really enjoyed that. And you get to see how they uh, prepare food for their large animals. This is the large animal kitchen. It's very clean, very sterile. And this is when I looked at this kitchen and said, ah, I see what I'm missing in my kitchen. I don't have a bandsaw. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bandsaw in my kitchen. My wife said no. Uh, and then you see funny things like this. Of, oh, yeah, okay, people work here, and they can't contaminate the animal food with their germs. And you have funny pictures like this that you get to put on Facebook or Pinterest or whatever. Uh, and we saw how they stored the food. They had a freezer for, um, what was that, two different freezers and refrigerators. It was really fascinating. You kind of weird like bricks of chicks for the you know eagles or something like that, frozen chicks um, and all kinds of other stuff. They had lots of seafood things for I think it was the sea otters, clams and stuff like that. 
Uh, and then we, we had dinner. They provide pizza, salad, juice, stuff like that. It's a fairly healthy dinner with some fruit. Go around, do a bunch of activities, and eventually you end up with your gear being delivered to, we were in a meeting room, a big meeting room. And you throw out your stuff, it's about 11.30, you all go to bed, everyone's tired, the scouts are exhausted. Um, and you learn who's snoring, who doesn't snore. You get up in the morning, you have breakfast, and they have an enrichment activity, which we got to watch an orangutan play with a box. Uh, for my money, it was about $60 a person, I think it was a cut rate for adults, I don't remember what it was. Uh, I thought it was mediocre, I just had a friend of mine from Woodbed sit through my first session of this, and they got to go see enrichment with big cats. And they had a more, a more positive experience. It was more recent. And I think my takeaway from that is, with the Oregon Zoo, your mileage may vary. Our experience was OK. It wasn't great. His experience was fantastic. So it's out there. Like I said, I think it's about 60 bucks a person. Um, the scouts had a good time. Am I going to go back again anytime soon? Eh, might think about three years down the line. That's the zoo. Uh, Oregon Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum also does a thing called Night Flights. They're down in McMinnville, just down the road here, actually. Uh, and my pack did this about, gosh, what was it, spring of 2015, I think it was? Yeah, spring of 2015. Uh, these are my two boys here. Oh, it must have been 2014. Anyway, uh, and they have three buildings. The northernmost building is rockets, space, stuff like that. The middle building is a theater, so a pair of theaters, and the southern building is the historic um, airplanes. You start in the, in the northern building with all the rockets and you see you know, replicas like the moon lander, and I think this is a Gemini capsule. It's pretty cool, all kinds of different rockets, a lot of uh, space race era stuff. They gather these together for dinner, again, pizza, salad, juice, you know, some soda, stuff like that. Uh, they accommodate both the zoo and the Evergreen Aviation Museum will accommodate for dietary restrictions if you have preferences or allergies. Uh, they do a really good job. Then they transition you to the middle building where we watched a video for an hour, a uh, three video on the creation of the Boeing Dreamliner, the 787. It was a cool video. It struck me very much as a Boeing's ad for Boeing. <laughs> but it was still a cool video. Uh, the weirdest part was one of the previews was very gory for one of the things. We had like a four year old in the audience. They were showing me some World War II reenactment. Ooh, but it was just the preview. I mean, was, it didn't cover the Cover the eyes. Uh, and then we transitioned to the southern building where all the historic aircraft were. And uh, really neat stuff in there. And they had a whole program. This fellow's name here is Mike. And he's talking to our scouts for about 20 minutes about the Wright Flyer. They have the Wright Flyer replica here. And he's going over the avionics and what happens, why the wings are twisting, what happens when the wings twist. And it was a really interesting presentation. He brought one of our scouts and did a demonstration with a ribbon of some kind. I forget what it was. But it was really cool. And then we transitioned over and shifted to the Sopwith Camel. We have, I think this guy's name is Chuck, telling us about how the Sopwith Camel was so revolutionary for the time period. Why it was so interesting. Why it was a big deal. And you look at this, the scouts are just enraptured. They're, they're, they're eating it up. Uh, scouts love airplanes. We also partnered up with the Girl Scout group. And then we shifted over to the Spruce Goose, the big thing in the room and sat in there for 10, 15 minutes while Chuck told us about why the Spruce Goose was interesting. A lot of our scouts don't know about Howard Hughes, right? They don't know idea who this quirky guy was. And you know, Chuck's telling us about how why there isn't a stitch of spruce in the whole thing, why we call it the Spruce Goose and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was based at the end of the program. It took about an hour, hour and 15 minutes going through that stuff. Uh, they let us go get our gear, bring our stuff in, lay our sleeping bags, go get changed the pajamas, head to bed. And the kids are tired, but they don't know it yet. My, my two boys, no, oh, Daddy, I'm not tired. I'm not tired. Five minutes later, <laughs> this is me texting my wife, honey. Um, they really do run kids. <coughs> well, you wake up the next morning, you have breakfast. And breakfast is cold cereal and fruit. It's continental breakfast kind of thing. And then they have an activity. They have your scouts make um, rockets, paper rockets. One piece of paper, two paper clips, and a piece of tape. And then they go outside and they launch their rockets with compressed air. And that was a blast. No pun intended. This is my youngest. He wasn't even a Cub Scout yet. He was five years old. He must have launched his paper rocket 15 times. Just kept getting back in line. All kinds of people's line. 
Um, I can't say enough good things about Evergreen Aviation Museum, despite their financial challenges they've had over the past few years. They've been on a great program. Uh, the cost, I think, was $55 per scout, $35 per adult. And I think that's a pretty darn decent deal for the program that they delivered. My biggest complaint was the preview to the Boeing movie. Um, it's a great thing. And I apologize, I thought I fixed this the other day. Question on the Evergreen. Oh, go ahead. Did they ever talk about the scouting history behind the Michael Smith? They mentioned it a little bit. It wasn't really part of the program. The program was focused on there. the airplanes and the stuff. Um, and there was a mention of, and we actually noticed that, because we hadn't been there, Oh, there's a big Boy Scout thing there back is there. Big there. Big yeah. uh, but they didn't really thump it too hard. It was really all about the program. It's interesting because that guy is like huge. Huge. Yeah. And they, they didn't really go into it. A lot of places in there, even where it's inside some of it, a lot of it was scouting Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, they love to have scout groups come through. Like I said, we had a Girl Scout group join us. And they slept in the rocket thing while we slept into the spruce goose. And you can choose either one, is what I understand. You can choose the rocket flight, night flight or the spruce goose night flight. Um, I thought the spruce goose was pretty cool. Okay, so um, I apologize for this. It's not the Newport Aquarium, and I realize this because my pack is actually going to the Oregon Coast Aquarium in three weeks. <clears throat> it's the Oregon Coast Aquarium. This link is wrong. I thought I fixed it. And it's not sharks after dark. It's sleeping with the sharks. So I apologize for that. Please be aware. And. Um, do my best to fix that for next year. Uh, Newport Aquarium does a great overnighter. Um, their program is you show up at 6, you show up at the side door. I can get out the uh, agenda if you want. Uh, you, there's a dinner involved. It's pizza, salad, da 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 da, the usual kind of thing. And they have a whole bunch of activities I'll talk about in just a second. The point I do want to make is the Oregon Coast Aquarium is very explicit that they will not deal with food allergies or any kind of food preference. You can either eat what they offer or you can bring your own food. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, they have a program that's mainly centered, I think, a lot around the touch tanks, uh, all kinds of good stuff, a few hours of, of, uh, of enrichment, structure, uh, good stuff. I only hear good things. I haven't done it yet, but I only hear good things. I think there's a snack involved, and you get to sleep in the tubes. There are three tubes, and they're kind of joined by pods, or sort of a half sphere sort of thing. Uh, this is the shark tube, I think. They can sleep a total of 25. And there's another one called Halibut Flats, and there's another one called something else. If you take more than 25 humans, not everyone will get to sleep with the sharks. Be aware of that. I've had to deal with this recently with my back. You're not all going to be able to sleep with the sharks. You might sleep with the halibut. It's OK. Um, the best part, and I heard from um, <clears throat> PAC 723 in my district, did this not too long ago, and the gal um, that I talked to said the best part was they woke up the next day and had breakfast and got to feed the sea otters in the morning. It was the best part of the whole thing. So uh, I, if you email me in a month, I'll report back and tell you how it went. <clears throat> but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the cost is $65 per human, I think. Um, no breaks for chaperones or anything like that. There's a lot of forms to fill out and signatures to sign away in terms of, you know, I agree not to kill the fish or eat the fish or whatever. Uh, OMSI. OMSI has two overnighters. They have a museum overnighter and they have a submarine overnighter. Please note that it is stated for grades 3 through 12. Has anybody done an OMSI overnighter? Nobody? Okay. One of these days I'll... One of the, uh, they were the Weeblos okay. at that point, and they had done it. Okay. Sounded like it was fun. Okay, I don't know much about it. I just know they do it. And I was wondering if I found somebody, yeah, I've been, and it was great, and we did these things. The uh, deal was the, the dad had been a submariner. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Take the dad and do the thing. I hear good things about it. I don't know what the program is. I'm sure that Turban Hall has something to do with it, because Turban Hall is awesome. Um, and again, grades 3 through 12. They also do the submarine overrider. My um, neighbor's kid did the submarine overrider as a Boy Scout about 20 years ago. And he said it was hilarious. They, they did this whole thing where they did a mock, let's take the submarine out for a drive. And then shut the thing and then turn on the machine that makes the thing rumble and feel like it's going. And he was on periscope duty. He's like, dude, we're not going anywhere. Shh. Yeah, just go with it. We're doing this fun thing. Um, so they have a whole program, probably history and whatever not. And the thing is, you sleep in the racks. 
you sleep in the racks in the submarine. And as scouts, they're usually pretty small. They don't care. They're fine. But the adults, he said, he, all night long, he's heard kablang, whack, ow, <laughs> <laughs> Some of the pedaz weren't fitting in the bunks very well. Be aware of that. Uh, otherwise, I hear it's a good thing. I don't know what the cost is, but it's something to do. Uh, if you're up north in the Vancouver area, battleground, what have you, uh, if you want to drive north instead of south, there is the USS Turner Joy up in Riverton, Washington. There is the link. Uh, the site indicates no exceptions. Minimum of age of eight years old. Please be aware of that. Now, it's a boat, military history kind of thing. I know that Cub Scouts have done it. I apologize for the photo that was taken with a potato. But there you go. It's a Cub Scout pack. They, they assume they're all over age eight or age eight or older. Um, and I don't know what the program is. Anybody been here and done this? Curious? No? OK. Um, I know it's a great program. I've heard a couple people who said, yeah, I know somebody who did that. It was great. I don't know what they do, but it looks like a lot of fun to me. Again, you sleep in the racks, um, so be aware of that. It's not going to be Motel 6, Motel 6 or whatever. And uh, have fun. So that is the northern bound. I've got 10 more minutes. Go ahead. Well, I forgot when you said day trips. Um, okay. One of the fun things to do, if you have a whole bunch of car buffs, is to go down to now Moda. Do the monster trucks oh, in February. Okay. And they give you a significant cut rate if you're scouts. If you're scouts. So where is this? It's the those like monster It's just the monster train. Oh, train. oh, oh that's the roof quarter. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's, it's now Moda. The Mo Moda Center. Thank Moda Center. So okay. Fine. Yeah, but it's I mean it, it was like 10, 12 bucks okay. a person. Cool. So it's not bad. I mean it's loud, right? Yeah, but you, get, but, you, if you, but you can do, you can choose to go earlier, ah. and then you go onto the field, and you can go up and get near the truck, the yeah. vehicles, and the drivers. And I never thought of that as much. Well, <laughs> but the kids love the huge trucks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then you have the husband who loves the huge trucks. Yeah, and you just yeah, stand yeah. there and just yeah. go. Wear your camouflage. Yeah, yeah, yeah you go. So I'm just saying for those of us who yeah. are not the intellectuals, for those of us who want to go redneck. I appreciate that. That's cool. The kids there's, there's probably a, a destruction derby somewhere too. Um, yeah, you watch them destroy and <laughs> pieces of the truck fall off. All right, I've got 10 minutes. I want to whip through camping, family pack, um, den camping as well. There is a, a uh, session on camping with Cub Scouts. I believe it's the next session. If you want to know the difference between a family camping, pack camping, and den camping, go hear from, I think it's Mr. Carroll that teaches that. It's a good one. I'm going to go over really quickly. I'm including summer camp, and the Reader's Digest version is get your Cub Scouts to summer camp. I have my own whole hour presentation I do at Roundtable over here. The, the, the theme here is I've seen this personally. Cub Scouts who go to camp are more likely to re engage the program at the beginning of the traditional program year. I've seen scouts get just kind of vapor ether off into nowhere, and they, they were the ones that went to camp because they didn't go get excited, they didn't go out the fun and get reimbued the fun of, of Cub Scouts. So get your scouts to summer camp. We're going beyond that. We're taking our scouts camping. Wolf requirement, go camping with your pack or family. Bear requirement, go camping with your pack, period. Unless you have a, a charter order exemption, which is really LDS. So we're going camping, guys. Number one, get balloon trained. You need to have at least the minimum requirement is one human who's balloon trained. It doesn't have to be necessarily a leader, a leader, but somebody has to go through balloon. And my recommendation is three, because what happens when Billy Cub Scout gets the barfs and has to go home, and somebody else cuts their finger and has to go to the hospital? Got to have the more people you have balloon trained, the better, just for those contingency plans. And Baloo, it takes about four or five hours. Usually there's lunch, and it's the guy who teaches it. It sends the trail is awesome. You can take it from um, Bob if you want. He provides lunch. It's awesome, good fun. Only about 15% of it is sleeping bags and tents. It's really all about cooking, uh, appropriate equipment, facilities you need when you go camping for your Cub Scouts, all that sort of thing. Um, required for wolf and bear, and you've got to have somebody else pull your train. Weebelow's leaders. We got any Weebelow's leaders in here? Yeah, you can go and take your Weebelow Scouts camping without the pack if you want to. You might be thinking, I'm not nuts, but you can. You can get a lot done out there if you go for a weekend. Now, the difference between pack and family camping, does anybody know the difference between pack and family camping? Okay. 
Family camping is every single Cub Scout who comes has a parent who is responsible for them. And at that point, you can invite cousins and siblings and whoever, whatever it is. Pack camping is it's the Cub Scouts and the leaders. And at that point, the charter organization is responsible. Pack camping, you've got one night. You cannot do two, one. Family camping, you can go for three nights a day, whatever, no big deal. We blows the same. Charter workers involved, responsibly, you should not be inviting siblings. You get one night, overnight, one thing. Maybe, maybe 24 hours. And that's a liability insurance thing. But you, as a We Blows leader, can go take your den camping. You can be camping in tents. You can go to council property and camp in the uh, A frame of the canvas. They're nice and drafty. You can go and camp in the dog houses. Which is picture Snoopy on top. Yep. The arrow. Um, the Adirondacks are great. They're fantastic. I love them. Uh, and if you meet your FOS goal, you can go to council property for free. Camp Clark, Camp Creek, are great ones. Uh, Cub World, while well, we still have it. We're going to go to Cub World in April next year. So that's available to you. While you're there, do a flag ceremony. Why not? Bring a flag. There's flagpoles probably, right? And have that element of citizenship to so your scouts. Do some tie some knots. Maybe bring a Boy Scout troop with you. Too. If you have a big brother Boy Scout troop here, charter board, uh, also charters. Have uh, them come and teach some knots. Uh, teach them to build fire. Fire is great. I think that's not fire. Have a campfire. Have you know songs, skits, games, all those things. Kids will do stunts, jokes. Okay, so here's my second point. Somebody liked my um, my uh, lesson plan for a. Hi, this is my lesson plan for camping. We're going to go camping. We're going to try to get a lot of advancement knocked out. So we're going to go. So we're going to go on Friday evening. We're going to go to Camp Clark. Everybody's going to arrive. We're going to unpack. It's settled. We're going to go to Cracker Barrel, maybe. We'll camp a little campfire, nothing huge, and go to bed. We're going to use Saturday for all our advancement and fun activities. Sunday, we have breakfast. We pack up and go home. So we're going to do Saturday. Saturday morning, we're going to pick things that all of our scouts need to accomplish. Let's say we haven't done the hike yet, so we're going to need the outdoor code, leave no trace. Got some knots. We'll have some Boy Scouts teach some knots. I'll show you the knots in a bit. We're talking about six essentials, weather preparedness, different rotations of stations, have Boy Scouts teach them different things. Maybe something fun, scavenger hunt, I don't know, a game, something like that. That's the morning. Call it two hours. You have breakfast, you do a rotation. And the scouts are done, they're getting bored by about 11.30. Okay, so then you have lunch. What is lunch? Sandwiches? Scouts can make their own sandwich. Bread, lettuce, pickles, sesame seed bun, what have you. Hey, they just made their own lunch. They check some stuff off on this one. Afternoon is different. We're going to split the dens up. Let's say you assume you have dens of six, seven, eight scouts. They're going to go different directions. Your tigers and wolves are going to go on a little walk through the hike. Kind of like the hike you talked about before. We're going to assume you haven't done it yet. They're going to do animal identification. They're going to go look at things and check off a few things. The bear and the arrow of light den need to go set up tents. The bears need to set up tents and do it with help and prove they can do it. The arrow of light den needs to do it without help. We below those dens, we're going to cast iron chef. They're going to go build a fire. We're going to build a fire, light a fire, safely put out a fire, all that kind of stuff. And then, while the dens are out there, they finish all those stuff, they're going to go and work on their skits, their songs, their stunts, their, their run on the campfire with their den leader. And then you can report back to the Arrow of Light den because the Arrow of Light den has to coordinate the campfires. So the Arrow of Light den is writing everything down, checking in with all the dens, making sure it's age appropriate, all those things. And maybe there's some free time, Saturday afternoon, maybe you have frisbees, soccer balls, go out on the beach, whatever. You have dinner, you've got to have your beers and your wee below scouts help prepare the dinner because there's a bunch of stuff there. And then you have a campfire. The Arrow of Light leads the campfire, they coordinate it, maybe they're emceeing, and all that kind of good stuff. Wake up the next morning and go to bed. What did we accomplish? Your tiger leader, leader will thank you. You've knocked off two of seven from tigers in the wild and two of five from backyard jungle. Uh, outdoor pack meaning campfire, uh, six essentials we talked about. We had our Boy Scouts in the morning convention talking about six essentials. Two different kinds of birds. We talked about we looked at our jungle. Our wolf den leader will thank you. You nearly finished Call of the Wild. Six of the seven in a 72 hour period. That's pretty good. And Howl of the Moon. You nearly finished that one off too. Original skit, working within the plan, that's all the skit stuff. That's great. Your wolf leader will thank you. Your bear leader will thank you because you've killed over half of the requirements for bear necessities. Go over camping over at it with your pack, that's the big one right there. Perform a skit or a song with your den. Cook lunch or dinner. 
tenths. Make sure two half inches are in the knots. And the one back here is uh, overhand knot and square knot. Your weevil is leader will thank you because you knocked off three of the five for cast iron chef, and that's a big one. That's required. The fire, the balanced meal, all that stuff. Your arrow of light, leader will thank you. You almost finished camper. Came really close. Leave no trace, outdoor code, all those things. Questions? Thoughts? Aye. Okay, that's my recommendation. That's my syllabus. Uh, I've got another minute or two. I'm going to wrap up. Be careful with fire, water, shooting sports, climbing. Don't take your Cub Scouts to Smith Rock. It's not okay. Petroleum powered vehicles and horses can be dangerous. You can go swimming and boating. You've got to know the rules. Know the policies and follow them. The guy to safe scouting is your friend. You can still do these things. Just be aware. Know what the training requirements are and know if you have anybody who is trained. Uh, two deep leadership is always required. <coughs> like I said, if you have 40 Cub Scouts and you're going hiking, you only have two adult leaders, you do not have sufficient leadership. You need more people, you need more folks. Youth protection training always required. If you're going overnight, it's always a good idea to bring the medical forms, part A and B. Every single participant, just in case something happens. If something happens and mom and dad aren't there, and they're incapacitated and Billy needs medical help, you've got that information, you can get that help. A tour and activity plan might be required depending on where you're going and what you're doing. Wes Forty teaches the class on that called Safe, uh, Scouting Safely. Go check out his class if you're not familiar. The short answer is it never hurts to file a tour and activity plan. Always have a first aid kit, mine's in my backpack. Uh, guide, guide to Safe Scouting, they sell the copies. I got a, a resource here in just a second down the scout shop. There is an app on your phone, but you need internet access. So does that make sense when you're going out into the back country? Not so much. Uh, and adults who CPR training, great idea. Neil! Hey. How are you doing? Yeah. Uh, get your scouts out of the meeting place. Hold on a second. Call to action. Even better, get them outside. Go out, do things that your scouts wouldn't normally be doing. That's what scouting is all about. Uh, try different activities. Don't be stuck in a rut. And do your best to make sure everybody's having fun. Yes. So. Going back to the first aid kit one. First aid kit. Is it, is it good to bring the kid and the kit, or just the kid? <laughs> <laughs> Always an editor in the audience. Oh, uh, here's some resources for you guys. Gang Safe Scouting. I apologize, I forgot to update this. This is the 2014 version. There is a link to the 2015 version. The price is the same as the scout shop. They do not print them on use print anymore, unfortunately. You can download the app on your phone, but as soon as you're out of range and don't have internet access, it's worthless. There's also the appropriate guidelines for scouting. This is an 11 by 17 sheet. I love this thing. And it's just a chart. It's a synthesis of the guide to safe scouting. It's a great way to say, okay, we're doing this activity. Is it appropriate for our Cub Scouts? Resources. Outings and field guides from DSA National Council. That's a good one. CPC has a segment guide. If you're looking and saying, what should I be doing? What can I do with my Cub Scouts? What different activities can I do? Segment guy. I bring that and give it to every single one of my adult leaders in annual planning. Here's some ideas just to get those juices flowing. Uh, the tour activity plan it is now online only. You're no longer submitting paper forms. So make sure you have a account and have somebody who's doing tour activity plans, whether it's your committee chair, cup master, whatever it is. Now. Thank you very much for being here. I'm sorry I went two minutes over. Have a great day. I hope you're having an awesome time. At University of Scotland. Yes.